Welcome to this official session launching our call to action for shipping decarbonization. I am Margie van Gogh. I have the privilege of leading the supply chain and transport portfolio of initiatives at the World Economic Forum. And on behalf of the Getting to Zero Coalition partners, the Friends of Ocean Action, the Global Maritime Forum, and the World Economic Forum, it is a pleasure to welcome you, our global audience, the signatories of the call to action, and our STEAM speakers joining today's panel. For the world to decarbonize by 2050, maritime 80% of traded goods are moved via ocean transport and maritime supply chains are therefore essential to sustainable global economic growth, serving societies the world over. While shipping results in the lowest carbon footprint of all transport modes, it still contributes more than 3% of greenhouse gas emissions. More than 150 companies have joined hands to sign a call to action in order for us to ensure that we can and do decarbonize fully by 2050 in the maritime sector. Given the economic lifetime of a maritime vessel is more than 20 years, there really is no time to waste. We simply must make zero emission vessels ready and the default choice by 2030. Signatories of the call to action are already taking concrete steps in pledging commitment to measures that lead to decarbonization of the sector. Today, in the lead up to COP26 and beyond, Signatories from across the value chain are calling on governments to one, align shipping with the Paris Climate Accord and temperature goals by committing to decarbonizing international shipping by 2050. Two, supporting industrial scale zero emission shipping projects through national action. And three, deliver policy measures that will make zero emission shipping the default choice by 2030. So on behalf of the Getting to Zero Coalition, we welcome active participation in this session, exploring what is required to accelerate a zero emission shipping future. And here's inviting you to enjoy a short opening video, following which Johanna Christensen, CEO of the Global Maritime Forum, will introduce our esteemed panel and moderate the conversation. Thank you, Margie. Um, my name is Johanna Christensen, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Global Maritime Forum, a founding partner of the Getting to Zero Coalition alongside the World Economic Forum and Friends of Ocean Action. When the Getting to Zero Coalition was established two years ago at the UN Climate Action Summit, it was with just about 50, uh, 50 members. And um, and uh, 50 members, companies that were, that were committed to um, uh, zero emission vessels operating on the deep seas by 2030. Uh, today, the coalition has uh, over 150 company members and further 30 members uh, that are uh, either supporting organizations, uh, NGOs, academic institutions, and other parties that participate in the collaboration in this collaborative alliance. It is a task force of the Getting to Zero Coalition that has been working together over the past six months uh, to develop the call to action for shipping decarbonization. And today at launch, the call to action has uh, over 150 uh, companies uh, signed up. It, this morning, it was 157. I think in the meantime, it's, it's a little more than that, but it's in that vicinity. Uh, and we are really pleased that some of the uh, the uh, signatories to the call to action and members of the task 
force that were that joined us in developing this that um, that will be joining us here today. Um, but before we dive into the details of the call to action, I would like to introduce Aditi uh, Maheshwari, who is Director for Climate Action at the UN. Aditi, over to you. Thank you so much, Johanna. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Uh, it is truly my pleasure to share this virtual room with you today. Before I say anything else, a huge congratulations to the Getting to Zero Coalition and all the signatories of the call to action that's been released today. It's quite an achievement to have 157 right at the outset, so uh, well done. It's really encouraging to see companies working across geographies and parts of the maritime value chain to really speed up the maritime industries journey to zero emissions by 2050. Your leadership is urgently needed and very much welcome. Um, I would yesterday, as you know, or you may have heard, the Secretary General sounded the alarm in his speech to the 76th session of the general debate. The world is waking up to the climate emergency. Uh, we are seeing movement and agreement around our common goals. We need to cut global emissions by 45% by 2030 from 2010 levels and achieve net zero emissions by 2050 to keep the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement within reach. We cannot achieve this without everyone taking action now and to this, uh, with this in mind, the Secretary General has been calling for a few things in, to deliver success at Glasgow. And the first of which is sort of every country, every city, every company, every industry needs to join that global net zero by 2050 coalition and follow up with credible, concrete, near-term plans and pathways that achieve this long-term vision. In addition, he's calling for a breakthrough and adaptation and for finance, all financial flows, public and private, to be aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. The science cannot be clearer. We have reached a code red for humanity, as underscored by the latest IPCC report that uh, was released this summer. We've lived through yet another year of climate disruption, and but Nonetheless, I mean, from the announcements yesterday and the work that is ongoing, we are hopeful that the world is indeed waking up because we don't really have time to snooze on this. Over the past six months, we've seen a political shift and an increase in the commitments from countries and cities and companies stepping up around uh, ambition on climate. Today, two thirds of global emissions and 70% of the global economy are under a net zero target. The Race to Zero campaign has almost doubled in size since last year's Climate Week, counting now, I think, uh, 4,470 companies, 799 cities, 35 regions, 222 financial institutions as signatories. It's increasingly clear that decarbonization is unstoppable. This creates a really strong and growing imperative for all industries to decarbonize or really face an existential business risk. Those who move fastest will leverage massive commercial opportunities while laggards face the risk of stranded assets. Shipping has a key role to play in to keep the 1.5 degree C Celsius temperature goal of the Paris Agreement within reach and can accelerate this energy transition. In 2018, the International Maritime Organization set an ambition for shipping to reduce its global uh, greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% by 2050. This is a really important and commendable first step, but in light of the science and the growing momentum to do it, uh, net zero by 2050, we see an opportunity to raise this ambition further. And given the technological developments and the latest climate science, it is now time to fully align shipping and the maritime supply chain with the Paris Agreement and set course towards zero emissions by 2050, zero emission shipping by 2050. Re raising our long-term climate ambition is not enough. Urgent action is needed now. Analysis has shown that by 2030, we must reach at least 5% zero emissions fuels in international shipping and have commercially viable zero emissions vessels operating along deep sea trade routes. This means we need to build the necessary infrastructure for scalable zero emission fuels and energy sources, including production, distribution, storage, and bunkering. Achieving these 23 
2030 targets, it will require collaboration, not just across the maritime ecosystem, but also with governments. And today, the private sector is definitely leading the way and showing it through the call to action. However, private sector action must go hand in hand with government action. The decarbonization of shipping can only happen with the urgency and scale needed if national governments and international re regulators establish the policy frameworks that make zero emission shipping and fuel production commercially viable, investable, equitable, and inclusive. In this context, it's particularly important to address the needs of developing countries, in particular LDCs and small island developing states. We need to ensure that the necessary support, technology transfer and investment in the sector is, av is readily available to match climate ambition for the deep de decarbonization of the sector. This must be a transition that is just and equitable and that leaves no country, no company and certainly no worker behind. While the maritime decarbonization challenge is huge, it is not insurmountable. With the support of new technologies, digitization, and smart partnerships, and it offers significant opportunities for development. Many countries could move from a situation of sizable public spending on energy imports on fossil fuels to generating new income from production and exports and renewable energy solutions such as ammonia and green hydrogen. Shipping is a key demand side driver of this. We need to see much more North-South and South-South cooperation, technology transfer at, across all stakeholders and along the maritime value chain. And I want you to, I would like to encourage you to really support companies and port cities from the global South. The UN Sustainable Transport Conference taking place from the 14th to the 16th of October 2021 in Beijing, China, can really help to rally even more diverse leaders for this call to action ahead of COP26. So I'd like to thank again all the industry leaders present today. With your leadership and foresight, I have no doubt that we will solve this part of the emissions puzzle with huge benefits and knock-on effects for the entire energy transition. Thank you very much and over back to you, uh, Johanna. Thank you, Aditi. And thank you for reminding us of the urgency of the scale of the challenge, but also the opportunities that it, 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 it brings with it. I'm going to now turn to uh, Michael Parker, uh, Chairman of uh, Global Shipping, Logistics and Offshore at Citigroup, and Lasse Christofferson, Chief Executive Officer of Torvald Clavenis, who uh, chaired the working group that developed the call to action. But before I do so, I just want a, a quick remark to those who are joining us via Zoom. Um, if you have any questions about the call to action, uh, I encourage you to post those in the chat function. We will do our best to respond to them either in the chat or by posing the question to, to Lasse and Michael. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Joanna. <clears throat> and can I open by thanking Aditi for her very inspirational and supportive comments, many of which I think will be echoed by the rest of us in what follows. But let me, let me give you my perspective. Whether in ancient times or the modern day, shipping has been the enabler of commerce, international trade, and of course, globalization. Decarbonizing shipping will decarbonize global supply chains and help reduce emissions in every sector whose products are carried by sea and go through the world's ports and into the logistics chains on land. This is why it is so important that top COP26 give priority to this and encourage the International Maritime Organization to raise its ambition and accelerate its policies and actions. This is what this call to action urges governments to support and to work with the industry where many initiatives are already underway, as you will hear. Now, City is part of GFATS, the Glasgow Financial Alliance, committing to align operational and attributable emissions from their portfolios with pathways to net zero by 2050 or sooner. The role of finance in accelerating decarbonisation of all industries cannot be understated. And my CEO, Jane Fraser, together with other senior colleagues, will be in Glasgow to articulate what the financial sector is doing and can do. As the preeminent global bank with a long-standing tradition in shipping finance, I am proud that Citi was one of the architects and founding signatories of the Poseidon Principles, the first sectoral initiative by leading banks committing to measure 
the carbon intensity and climate alignment of our shipping portfolios on an annual basis. We expect early next year to move that alignment target from today's current IMO target to alignment with the Paris Agreement consistent with this call to action. But let me take the opportunity to thank the other 26 signatories to the Poseidon Principles uh, and I hate to single out anyone, but I'd like to express my gratitude to uh, SOCGEN, ING and DNB, who were all very supportive during the drafting process. Now, shipping, as Aditi has mentioned, is a user of and transporter of energy and must be part of the energy transition, which is why it should be a priority soon. Finance can show what is possible and collaboration across the sectors with finance will make a difference if accompanied by the necessary accelerated regulation and more ambitious policies to enable shipping and thus the global supply chains to be decarbonized. And that is the only way that the industry will meet the target set out in the Paris Agreement. And I have like to hand over to Lassie. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I'm also proud to have been part of this industry-led uh, coalition that has uh, drafted the call to action that we are presenting today. Uh, and as you mentioned, there are many industry uh, players that are taking a lead on this. And we in Clavenus believe we are one of them. Uh, and as an example, we have committed to have uh, all our vessels being uh, carbon neutral by 2030 and all of operations to be zero emission by 2050. So we are ready to move, but we can't do this alone. Um, and that's why we look forward to governments and regulators to matching uh, our commitments and enabling us to bring this to reality. Specifically in this call to action, we call on governments to do three things. And that has been mentioned already, but I'd like to stress it again. One, shipping needs to be aligned with the Paris Agreements, and we need to have a goal of zero emissions and be decarbonized by 2050. To do so, we need governments to deliver clear and equitable implementation plans to achieve this, and we believe they need to do so through IMO latest by 2023. Two, we need governments to support industry scale emission shipping, zero emission shipping projects uh, through national action by setting clear goals and also bringing incentives to support, to support the first movers and a broader deployment of zero emission fuels and vessels. And last but not least, number three, we need governments to deliver policies and regulations that make zero emission vessels the default choice to order by 2030. This means and includes market-based measures that neutralize the competitiveness gap between zero emission fuels and carbon-based fuels. And we need these market-based measures to be in deployment by 2025, so we can, as an industry, move on and order zero emission vessels. So to wrap it up, to decarbonize global supply chains, or actually to decarbonize the world economy, the world needs to decarbonize shipping. The bad news is that the market will not solve it itself. If the market are to decide, we have the answer, and that's carbon-based fuels. As demonstrated by the many signatories to this call to action, the industry is actually ready to move. Now, we need governments and regulators to move with us and deliver the right regulations with an ambitious timeline. Thank you. Thank you, Lasse and Michael. Um, Whilst we see if there are any, uh, any uh, participants in the call today that wish to ask any questions about the call to action, specifics, um, details about, uh, about the content and whatnot, um, I'm really pleased to um, invite 
uh, a group of supporters of the call to action, signatories to the call to actions to join um, this discussion. Um, they each represent a different part of the maritime ecosystem. They each represent a different geography uh, and important geographies in the maritime ecosystem. And of course, they've each made specific commitments that uh, they're here to talk about today. Um, first, uh, I would like in, to invite uh, Takeshi Hashimoto, uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Mitsui OSK Line um, to speak. And then I'll, I'll call on you each individually subsequently, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. Hashimoto-san, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Joanna. Uh, uh, my name is Hashimoto of Mitsuo Skylines. Actually, I'm quite a uh, newcomer as a, a CEO of uh, MOL, and uh, I took uh, the, this uh, position since uh, April this year. And uh, the, my immediate uh, uh, ac uh, one of the uh, actions uh, was at, uh, the, uh, to set up uh, our long-term uh, goal uh, of uh, that, uh, the, our uh, environmental policy, so-called uh, the MOL Group uh, Environmental Vision 2.1. And uh, the, could you uh, could I ask that, that to show my, my the paper? Uh, the next one, please. Next page. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so that... Uh, 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 MOL, a uh, Japanese shipping company that we are operating uh, about uh, 800 uh, vessels uh, all over the world. And as of today, that 100% of our vessels are using uh, the fossil fuel, mainly that oil, and some of uh, the, the part of them are, the, are using that uh, other, other fuel like uh, LNG, LPG, or methanol, but uh, the, uh, uh, every single vessel that uh, uh, are doing that, a lot of the emission. And the, uh, we recognize that uh, the necessity uh, to, uh, to transform that our uh, fleet uh, uh, in a very long, uh, uh, according to the very long, long term planning. And uh, the, uh, the, so that therefore, that uh, the, uh, we, uh, we set up uh, the three. Target uh, the uh, one is that uh, the, uh, deploy the net zero emission uh, ocean going vessel in uh, 2020s. So that uh, the, uh, uh, it's uh, it was uh, the, uh, so called that uh, the, uh, by uh, 2030. But uh, the, uh, our target now is that uh, the a little bit uh, earlier than it. Uh, the, so that uh, to 20. 2027 or 28, uh, we would like to launch that uh, the, uh, the commercial operation of uh, our first uh, the zero emission vessel. Uh, most likely, the, uh, it will be that uh, ammonia burning uh, uh, vessel, and uh, the, uh, because uh, the, uh, technically uh, it is uh, the only uh, alternative for us uh, the, uh, as of today. It, uh, uh, to complete uh, within a few years' time. Then, uh, secondly, that uh, 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 by uh, 2035, uh, we, we, we would like to reduce that, uh, the total uh, GHG emission uh, by our uh, whole fleet uh, about 45%, uh, so uh, versus uh, 2019. It's uh, again that uh, the quite uh, uh, aggressive target, uh, the, uh, I will uh, explain the how to achieve it uh, a little bit later. Then, uh, then uh, sadly, uh, as uh, the everybody are saying that uh, the, uh, uh, to complete uh, our uh, target, uh, 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 the zero emission, uh, net zero emission by uh, 2050. The next page, please. Uh, to do so that uh, 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 we, uh, it's not uh, that straightforward that, uh, that we need to choose that quite uh, complicated uh, 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 the method. Uh, uh, as of today, that uh, uh, we consider that, uh, that reducing uh, the GHD uh, by uh, uh, utilizing the, uh, every possible method uh, is uh, the quite essential. So that uh, 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 for the time being that uh, the LNG is uh, much cleaner and uh, the better fuel than oil. Therefore, that uh, the, for the time being, that uh, the while uh, we we are going to develop uh, the uh, 
uh, zero emission vessel like ammonia, but the mainly that uh, we will uh, construct a lot of uh, LNG burning uh, uh, ocean going uh, vessels. And uh, uh, that together with that, uh, the, uh, the uh, more efficient uh, 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 operation uh, planning and uh, the size and uh, reducing the speed, uh, uh, that perhaps that, uh, that we can uh, we can uh, we can reduce uh, that uh, the, uh, 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 emission level to the more than thirty percent, uh, almost forty percent by uh, uh, utilizing uh, LNG instead of uh, fuel. At, at the same time, uh, the, uh, uh, and, uh, up to uh, 2030, 35, uh, uh, we will uh, gradually, gradually that, uh, that develop uh, the, uh, new uh, uh, alternative fields uh, like uh, ammonia or uh, some kinds of the methanation, uh, et cetera. And uh, the, uh, then uh, as, as, as you can see that uh, this chart uh, 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 by 2050, uh, we want to, uh, uh, we would like to uh, uh, dramatically reduce that, uh, the uh, total emission volume uh, by our uh, fleet. However, uh, still uh, the, uh, uh, utilizing the today's uh, the technologies, that, uh, the, uh, it is almost uh, the impossible uh, that, uh, to achieve uh, real zero emission uh, by ocean going fleet. It, it is uh, our uh, analysis, therefore, that uh, the, uh, to achieve uh, that uh, the, uh, net zero position, uh, we also need to think about uh, that uh, quite uh, the, uh, different method uh, to uh, uh, to create uh, that uh, some uh, uh, credit uh, that uh, the, uh, uh, to uh, to give us. Uh, some uh, some room uh, or flexibility that uh, uh, to offset uh, our uh, 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 our minimum level of the emission. That is the where we are. So that uh, uh, people probably consider that uh, that it is a bit lukewarm approach. But uh, the, uh, we we think that uh, uh, this is uh, as of 2021. Uh, this is only the possible uh, the method. Uh, we can achieve. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving us this mm. detailed vision or an uh, explanation of the strategy that you are embarking on. I think that's that's really great to see the, the level of detail in the plans. Um, uh, next, I'd like to turn to YC Yi. Uh, YC, as president and group of ex chief executive of uh, MISC, you have you also have been working on a strategy for 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 decarbonization for some time and entered into, into a, numerous partnerships. Perhaps uh, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about that. And uh, yeah, over to you. Thanks, Johanna. Um, first of all, let me start by saying this: you know, for an industry that is perhaps well known to be fragmented. Um, highly competitive, maybe to the point of being confrontational. I would like to applaud and commend uh, the actors and players in the, in the industry for the speed at which the past couple of years that we have come together, right, through various global partnership, coalition, multi-stakeholders to try and decarbonize uh, and raise our ambition to try and decarbonize shipping and, and realize a net zero carbon shipping um, era come, come 2050. Uh, big thanks to platforms like GMF, Global Metan Forum, Welcome Forum, for bringing together willing partners uh, who are willing to join the coalition. In fact, because of, uh, of, of GMF, um, MIC, together with a few partners, we, we, we gave birth to the CASA Initiative, uh, which was launched early part of this year. And our mission for CASA Initiative is to try and uh, build, operate the first uh, MONA fuel deep, uh, deep sea ocean going tanker by 2025. Um, and uh, as we speak, uh, we have um, partners, other partners who have uh, wrote into us who are willing to, to join us. Right now we've got us, the ship owner, the ship manager, we have uh, an engineer producer, we've got a leading class society, we've got a leading shipyard, leading engine maker, we've got a leading port authority uh, who's part of this coalition. Uh, and we'll be adding a few more. Uh, and I'm confident that we can realize this 2025 uh, goal. So it shows one thing, if the industry uh, rallies together for a common goal, we can work together. But two observations, right? And I think these two observations are perhaps shared by everybody. Number one, 
the various partnership uh, uh, joint development projects around the world has have focused many on the technological or engineering pathway towards decarbonizing shipping and the, specifically is about a zero emission fuel. Um, and, I'm, and I'm very confident uh, come 2030, there'll be many, many pathways uh, from a technical engineering standpoint, which would allow us to achieve or, or make um, zero emission vessel available to everybody uh, in the ecosystem. And, and I've always believed there's no one single bullet. We need multiple pathways uh, towards getting there. I, I believe the technical, technical pathway will be available. Second observation here is that so far, a lot of this global partnership has been very much what I call private to private sector participation, right? Um, two observations. And because of this, it gives rise to two problem statements, two major hurdles that we're trying to address and, and, and specifically uh, bring up during COP26. Number one, we have only addressed the technical pathway towards decarbonization. We have not quite solved the other part of the equation, which is making it economically feasible to everybody. Um, in simple terms, making it uh, fundable, making the financial resources available to the ecosystem to go hand in hand with the technical pathway towards decarbonizing shipping. Um, it, and it's just not the energy transition, it's not, not just about um, emission, even the S in ESG, the social aspect is it's, it's coming, right? And we all have our ambitions for the social aspect for shipping as well. And all this um, has to be paid for. The ecosystem has to find a way to pay for all this. How do we do that? Second thing here is this, which is the second observation. We need to get the public sector involved. It has to be not just private to private sector participation, it has to be public private sector partnership, right? And this means government regulators, I think the previous speakers have said so. We have we need to have the public and private sectors ambition coming together and to make both the technical and the economic feasibility of decarbonization possible for the entire industry. If we can do that, we can definitely achieve our goal in 2050. Thank you. Thank you, YC. And I think you touch on a really important point and why it is that the, um, the discussions around the call to, uh, that were at the core of the discussions of the call to action and why it exists is really this tackling not only the technical aspects, but the commercial aspects of and the economic aspects of making the transition possible. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to Semiramis uh, Palu. Um, Semiramis is uh, not only uh, the CEO of Diana Shipping from Greece, but also the president of Helmepa, the Hellenic Marine Environment Protection Association. And it is in both capacities that she joins us here today. Uh, Semiramis, what, is, what in your view is the most important factor uh, to help achieve zero emissions in shipping? Um, I, I've got a lot of things to say. This is uh, probably one of the hardest equations we need to solve. There are a number of unknowns. Uh, I feel that we owe it to our children and to the future generations to transition into a more sustainable world. And uh, this is why I'm here today, uh, to support the call of action. Uh, I need to be part of the solution. I want to be part of the solution. Uh, shipping is bound to decarbonize. That's a given uh, thing. It's a certainty. It's a one-way street. Uh, what we need to make sure is that it's commercially viable and sustainable and that it involves the entire supply chain uh, and that we maintain a global level playing field. I think that's the most important issue here. Uh, and uh, we will do that um, by uh, making sure that we have a global reg reg regulatory framework developed by the IMO. The IMO is uh, the International Maritime Organization it is the only regulating body for our truly international industry. Uh, so I'm here today representing Helmepa. Helmepa is the Hellenic Marine Environmental Protection Association. It was founded 40 years ago by some very prominent and forward thinking and visionary ship owners that uh, realized early on that they needed to raise environmental awareness, to change the mindset of the people around, to protect the seas, and they did that at a time when regulation uh, around environmental issues was still at its infancy. So similarly, today, we're at a similar crossroad, 40 years after that, we're talking about uh, sustainability and decarbonization. 
And I think this is where Helmepa can uh, assist and help. We've done it before, and I think we can assist in its solution today as well. Uh, there is a very um, unique word in the Greek language. It's called philotimo. Uh, it's loosely translated as the goodwill or to do something over and above what is required or what is necessary uh, for the common benefit and for the common good. So this is what we're bringing to the table today. Helmepa is bringing the Greek philotimo, or in other words, the goodwill that we have and the embedded in our culture, our desire to bring people together for the common uh, purpose and for the common good. We bring a network of like-minded, open-minded, forward-thinking, adaptable stakeholders uh, that want to raise the agenda of decarbonization and uh, sustainability. So uh, what we need for a global solution, I think, is a global synergy effort. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Samaramus. Your Philotimo, I'm sorry if I pronoun mispronounced that, right, is right. very welcome and, and, and we really appreciate your, your contributing to this conversation today. Um, next, I will turn to Rasmus Back Nielsen, who's Global Head of Fuel Decarbonization of Traffic World and has also been heavily involved in some of the working groups focusing on closing the competitiveness gap that uh, Lasse spoke to earlier uh, within the context of the Getting to Zero Coalition and many other fora. Rasmus, over to you. Thank you, Johanna, and uh, congratulations to GTZ for the big achievement today. Uh, just very briefly about Traffic Wars engagement and who we are. So we are a global commodities trading house. We trade six and a half million barrels of oil per day, which is six and a half percent of world oil consumption. We are the second largest metals and minerals trader and the largest LNG trader. We have a lot of requirements for use of shipping transportation, and we have a significant fleet ourselves. So we are deep into the global engine room of uh, of uh, uh, carbon and, 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 and we have a task uh, decarbonizing it, uh, the shipping infra, infra, uh, industry. Uh, one question from the chat that leads me to what I will talk on for the next two minutes is uh, the mindset change we've seen for over the last 12 months and which we will need to continue to push forward. Uh, when we launched our white paper on a global IMO led shipping decarbonization uh, program, which was launched in September last year, there was initially a lot of criticism uh, particularly from IMO members uh, who we were speaking a lot to and they said, listen, we tried market-based measures in 2013, 2014, it didn't work and we don't think it can work still. Uh, through a lot of work and uh, a lot of momentum building with a lot of people, including most of the people on the call here today and organizations, we have seen a change of mindset. Uh, one example is a, a Scandinavian climate ambassador back in uh, January, February, he was also confirming there would be no price on carbon. Today, this amb climate ambassador is inviting uh, to talk about carbon pricing and supporting carbon pricing. So we've seen a tremendous mindset change. And why is that important? Well, because we're still facing people and IMO members who are saying, well, it's probably not feasible. We don't have the solution. We don't know what it is. And here we can only challenge and embrace and encourage people to change view and be dynamic because requirements are changing ever faster than we have ever seen before. And we cannot afford anyone, whether that's politicians, climate, energy, transport ministers, IMO member delegates, not to challenge themselves to bring shipping decarbonization forward. And the call to action today is the biggest and strongest support message from the industry that they can be given to go and make change happen. What is a fact is that the shipping industry cannot decarbonize to its own as well as society requirements without a cost neutralization of zero carbon fuels. And we are privileged as an industry because technology is ready. The engine technology is ready. The fuels are there, the hydrogen-based fuels, which we need to transition to. But the, the problem is that the zero carbon fuels are way too expensive to mass implement and people are holding back implementing them, which means that when people buy the ships, the fuels will not be available. The one thing that can fix this problem and challenge is regulation. Because as soon as we have regulation, will there be billions and billions of investments into green transportation fuels, which will be made available to all the people in the shipping industry. And that's the reason why we need regulators to go and cost neutralize the shipping fuel so we all can move ahead in a much faster trajectory than what otherwise is feasible. But again, 
We should also celebrate today because it's a fantastic achievement that the industry has come together on this and we need to build. And COP26 is tremendously important leading on to MEPC 77, where we need to see even more concrete action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rasmus. Uh, I'm now going to turn to Rachel Kite, who I think has a really good perspective of this uh, well, this, um, I'd say this hesitancy or this perceived lack of momentum amongst governments mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in her role as former advisor, a special advisor to the UN Secretary General and has really sat at the heart of many of these discussions for decades. Rachel, over to you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Joanna. And it's, it's just really uh, a great pleasure to be here. I remember two years ago, standing in the, the baking heat, actually, in the Rose Garden at, uh, at the UN headquarters um, with uh, the founding uh, sort of uh, signatories of, the, of what is now such uh, an important network. And, um, and in the conversations around getting the Getting to Zero network going, the alliance going, being really impressed by how uh, leaders within each part of the value chain were prepared to come and work together in a true partnership. And the fact that that sort of burgeoned and burgeoned and now you've started to get to this point now where you have really um, path-breaking uh, announcements and commitments being made within the fuel sector, within the shipbuilders and owners, the ports, um, uh, those who use uh, the ships to move their goods around. Uh, I think that this is, um, and the financiers of course, that this is really built for uh, success built for the long run. Now, of course, the long run is the short run because we've only got uh, a decade or two to sort all of this out. But I, I think that uh, what you've built is, is really important. And now comes the really hard work. And I think that the, uh, the declaration today is extremely strong. And what I think is really important about it, and also something for other uh, parts of the economy to, to study, is the very clear ask of those that need to come to the table in order to allow shipping, which is the lifeblood of global commerce, to be the green uh, lifeblood of, of, of global commerce. Um, and that in particular means the dialogue with, with government. I think in the past, um, often the business sector or business sectors have played a critical role in convincing politicians and convincing uh, policymakers, that if they act before they know every detail of how a transition is going to happen, that they will not uh, commit an error, that they will find that there is success on the other side. They, uh, I think the business sector has successfully laid the red carpet, as it were, for policymakers and politicians, that if you make this decision, the certainty that you will give us will allow us to do what business does best, which is to innovate and to speed and to scale. We're now at such a moment where the science, as Aditi said at the beginning of the session, means that we um, have got absolutely no room now for error and we have no room for plausible deniability within any sector of the management of our economies. This isn't the geopolitics of climate change. This is now the geopolitics uh, and climate uh, together. Climate is shaping the way that the world uh, works or should be. Uh, and I think that at the General Assembly, uh, outside of this conversation, we're beginning to see that perhaps we haven't quite all fully realised that yet. I borrowed that statement from Robin Nibbler at Chatham House, who I think uh, is, is doing some very interesting work in Europe, looking at uh, if, if climate really is an emergency, then why are governments not having different conversations with each other outside of discussing with each other whether or not they're going to arrive in Glasgow in November? So here you stand at a moment where you need help from government, uh, but where your partnership, I think, can actually spur governments to help you better. And I, I think it is about um, the industry really demanding uh, that government look at what the decarbonisation of shipping uh, sector means, not just for climate commitments and NDCs, but to the way in which they think about trade and the trading regime going forward and the way in which they think about cooperation and alliances. The final thing that I, I want to say is that having such a strong partnership behind such a clear goal and being quite clear about the timelines and the fact that there are ways to speed 
your own commitment to each other. Uh, that in, in that will be a very important implementation so that we don't leave anyone behind. Developing countries quite rightly look with great skepticism to many of the pledges and claims that are made by uh, global companies domiciled in the North and by the governments of the developed world. Uh, for as long as I can remember, governments have overpromised and underdelivered. The private sector is often under, under promised and over delivered. And therein is, is what is important. But as we build this global alliance, this global network dedicated to decarbonizing the, ship, uh, the shipping and maritime sector, making sure that governments understand that they do not need to trade off the greening of shipping with the access to the global markets that the developing country demands. And that there is a way to do this if they support developing countries to be part of this movement from the very beginning. And so I think it's a very important message that you need government's help. But it's also a very important message to major trading powers and major members of the G20, for example, that as they support this initiative, they ensure that there is no uh, green uh, premium for developing countries and that developing countries are supported to be part of this. After all, uh, many uh, flag nations are, are nations that will be struggling with their adaptation and resilience right now and, and need to understand that they will benefit from this movement. So I wish you all the best of success. It's been fantastic to, to, to be able to watch over the last two years. And I, I think that um, you will uh, over deliver um, and you need the support of government. I'd be happy to help reinforce that message. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate, uh, uh, Rachel, and we, I think we're going to we're going to need all the help that we can get. And I and I guess I, just jumping off of that, I, I I wonder if I could just turn back to Lasse for a short moment on this question that's kind of been uh, both in the chat function and just uh, running through the last few remarks around, you know, how how do we convince reluctant governments to adopt the policies that are needed? Lasse, you're on mute. Shit. I'm ready. Um, the, well, first of all, I think the CRO in 2050, we all agreed to. So that's not a big one. I think what they're referring to is probably the market best measures, or yes. as we put it, a price on carbon. And why will we convince the politicians? Well, because it is such a unique thing as a silver bullet. Um, and, and why so? Well, because for, the, for us to decarbonize supply chains has hardly any cost to society but has a big cost to the individual players in the supply chain. Let me give you one specific example. We in Klavenes, we have developed the concept of an ammonia carrier, can carry, uh, can carry wheat from South America to Europe on a zero emission vessel. The price of the, of the delivered uh, wheat will be 50% more than what it is today. But the price of the bread would only be 10% higher. So in other words, we need to create a bridge between the society's willingness to pay for decarbonization and the players' inability to bridge that competitiveness gap themselves. On top of that, with a price on carbon, uh, we will get funding to be able to drive pilot projects, to be able to compensate those companies or those countries who are worse off with increased cost of fuel. It's not a question of if the cost of fuel will increase, it's just a question of when. And last but not least, if people think that a price of carbon is not realistic, they're wrong. It's here already. It's here with the EU. EU have already said they will include uh, shipping in their ETS. So it's not a question of if we get a price on carbon, it's a question of how big it is, who regulates it, and not least, who benefits. Today, that's EU. In the future, we believe it's true IMO, a global scheme. Thank you, Lasse. I think that's uh, that's a really good point and, and one that will be carried forward in future conversations as well. How do we make sure that to uh, Rachel's final point that the transition is made equitable, that it's made just and that that all okay. countries stand to benefit from the transition, right? So, so I think that's that's the that's the important uh, aspect for us to work on collectively. Um, I, I would like to raise another question from the chat um, to and, and maybe 
YC can help us on this one. It's really the role of seafarers in the transition. And let me make sure that I, I, I read this out right. So um, how, how will we engage seafarers and other maritime workers to make sure that jobs and health and safety are protected so that we can build the trust and skills that we will be essential to make decarbonization work in practice? Do you have a perspective on that that you might like to add? Um, yes, I do, Johanna. I think fresh off the um, last week's uh, London International Shipping Week, where we were talking about social aspect of shipping, I think this fits into the heart of the whole thing because decarbonization, Industry 4.0, um, these are opportunities to try and move the shipping industry to the next, next era. But shouldn't let the technology uh, dominate, right? We must always pay attention to the human element. We must not leave the seafarers behind. So instead of looking at technology as a threat, I think um, man and machine and technology must coexist. So if you look at this as an opportunity, we could actually um, look at opportunities to try and upskill, widen the career opportunities for our seafarers uh, because the entire supply chain for my time will change right, from shore to sea. Um, and, and it gives rise to a lot of career opportunities. It also allows us to bring in diversity of talent, right? not we do, not, we do not just recruit talent from the traditional sources for maritime industry. With decarbonization, with technology, we can bring in a lot of other new stakeholders, players into the industry. So I think it is a big agenda. But back to the point I made earlier, the ecosystem must be able to pay for this, not just decarbonization. How do we sort of drive the social agenda for shipping as well? Can I just add one comment to that, Johanna? I, I think sure. decarbonizing shipping is not a threat to the CFR. It's safeguarding the CFR and the very system of global trade as we know it. If you don't decarbonize shipping, we will not be able to move goods around the world. We will lose jobs in the developing world and we will not have CFRs. So decarbonization is an enabler of seagoing jobs, not a threat. Thank you, Lasse. Um, before we close out, I'd like to ask a quick question of each of you. In, in, in shipping, as in many other sectors, the focus of the conversation is often on 2030, on 2050, on these really long-term timelines, as they should be as well, because of the time horizons that are needed to, to affect change. But right now, we are at a at a very particular moment in time with an opportunity over the next few months to potentially kickstart um, a transition. And I, I guess what I'd like to ask each of you is, what would you like to see happen in the next two months ahead of COP26 um, um, in order to, to make this transition a reality? And I'll start with Rachel. Uh, I, think, I think the, um, the, proof is, uh, the proof is often in the eating, uh, the pudding is in the eating, right? Uh, and I think that uh, the, the data that you've shown uh, already helps. And I think that now with uh, some leading ports coming forward and talking about timelines for decarbonizing uh, their operations as ports, you start to bring specific geographies together. I think cities can drive forward faster than countries can in some cases. And so I think by looking at a 2030 timeline and trying to show the routes, the, the players that can start to convert uh, a piece of the global industry uh, in a very short period of time to net zero starts to show that this could actually be something that grows globally. And then I think that the shipping industry is going to have to show up, uh, all, uh, the, all of the sectors of the shipping value chain are going to have to show up in a very um, uh, sophisticated way in Brussels, in Washington, in Beijing, in order to make the case that has just been made much more eloquently than me, that the, a green global shipping industry is actually the road to a more inclusive um, economy that works for everybody better, as well as a road to decarbonisation. I think those two things have to be understood together, and that will require a fairly sophisticated shift in mood um, in the trade debate. But um, uh, I think showing that it is possible to see certain uh, to, to see certain goods and certain um, point to point. Uh, 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 trading uh, options uh, work at a net zero basis. I think that that then will inspire. And I think that there are enough jurisdictions, cities and states around the world to be able to make that a reality. Thank you, Rachel. Rasmus, 30 seconds. Okay, uh, we would love to see uh, global policymakers, uh, whether that's energy climate ministers at COP26 and subsequent IMO member delegates, 
to get the understanding that they need to act now and uh, the industry is ready and it's supported, led by GTZ today. Uh, and when we when they have that understanding, I'm sure MEPC 77 will be a lot more successful than most people potentially anticipate. And I look forward to that. Thank you, Rasmus. Samaramis. I'm going to put you on the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think uh, the mindset is moving very fast. Uh, all stakeholders need to be uh, alert and embrace and engage in the changes. But most importantly for me as a ship owner, I want a global level playing field and that will only come from the IMO, our regulatory shipping uh, organization. Thank you. Thank you. Hashimoto-san. Yeah, uh, two things that uh, for coming few months time or one year, two years time period at uh, the, uh, uh, the switch to that uh, the, uh, the more uh, economically friendly fuel like LNG. And also that uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the acceleration of uh, the uh, electric supply from shore side will be that uh, uh, relatively easy uh, uh, solution that uh, the, uh, at least when the, uh, uh, the vessels are passing, then uh, they can uh, receive uh, that electric supply uh, from shore side and do not have to uh, use that their own uh, di uh, diesel generator uh, to maintain that the, uh, their uh, uh, power. Uh, so uh, it uh, it will be that uh, the, uh, the positive and uh, quite positive that direction and uh, relatively easily uh, achievable for the coming few years time. Uh, thank you. Uh, YC, what's your, what, what would you like to see happen in the next two months? Well, next. if Christmas, if Christmas <laughs> is to come, if Christmas is to come early, I will ask Santa for this, right? Uh, may the ambition of the private sector and the public sector be aligned. May the over-promising and under delivery of governments uh, and the over, um, under-promising and over delivery of the private sector come together. Maybe over-deliver and over-promise. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. That's a that's a great one. <laughs> uh, Lasse, what about you? Very specific. Governments need to stop talking about climate change being, you know, the conversation being expensive on for the society on, on uh, supply chains. It's not. It has marginal cost. We do have the technology. Uh, we will have a price in carbon. And now is the window to make sure that it applies to all globally. So all can take part of that transition. Uh, and uh, I think the means are there. And IMO is a unique tool to make global regulations and maritime industry is ready. Thank you, Lasse. And Michael, you get the, you get the pleasure of, or the benefit of the last word on this. Thank you. One of the problems, as we know, is that shipping has not been good at explaining itself. The narrative has not been good and politicians, frankly, don't really understand our industry unless they look out over the sea or over a port. As we've seen, very many wise men have said that if you deal with the hard to abate sectors first, the world will decarbonize faster. And I think between now and COP26, our job is to educate politicians to double the number of signatories, Joanna, from all those other cargo owners and ship owners that should already have signed, we'll give them the two months to sign so that we can change the story. And, and to YC's point, the collaboration we've seen in the industry through COVID, and by the way, COVID and the ever given should be a message to all politicians about the importance of supply chains. This collaboration shows what the industry is doing and can do and what we know the consumer will pay for. And so it's the mechanics and the political support and the financial support through market-based measures, that will make this happen. And if we keep telling the story, I think we'll get there. Thank you, Michael. I think that's a great way to close. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Margie. Thank you, Aditi. Thank you to our panelists, the COP26 task force that did the hard work of putting together this call to action and the team behind the Getting to Zero Coalition. I think, and finally, thank you to all participants who joined us here today for joining a lively discussion. I hope you were able to get at least some answers to your questions and otherwise, please feel free to reach out to the team um, and, and, and let us know what else. To Michael's point, uh, I hope we reach uh, 300 signatories by Christmas or certainly uh, in, uh, in the beginning of the new year. Um, let's, let's take that as a challenge. Uh, if you do wish to join the call to action, reach out to us, let us know. And uh, 
we look forward to working with you. Thank you.